Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the spring 2020, 2021 <laughs> Solidarity Semester. Whether you're watching live with us today or catching up on these recordings later on, we're glad that you're here. Today, we're going to be talking about how we can act as co-conspirators with Black migrants. Before we get into that, I just want to highlight what we've mentioned at the start of every one of these sessions, which is a disability justice framework adapted by the organizations in the ballot. We're grounding ourselves today and every day with the understanding that all bodies are unique and essential. And in that same vein, all bodies have strengths and needs that must be met. We are powerful because of the complexity and diversity of our bodies and not in spite of them. So with that in mind, there's a lot going on right now. We're into the second week of the Derek Chauvin trial, which for many people is an intensely traumatic event to relive and retell, and it will likely continue for several more weeks. Yesterday, Arkansas became the first U.S. state to prohibit physicians from providing gender-affirming treatments for trans youth, which, as many of us know, is life-saving care. We're continuing to see acts of anti-Asian violence across the country, and we're still confronting a global pandemic. So it's a really scary and really devastating time, and it's normal to carry the weight of that in your mind and your body, and we're feeling that right along with you. And just to return to their bodies, I know that I myself carry a lot of stress in my body. I will tense my shoulders as I'm doing right now. I clench my jaw and I grind my teeth. So I invite you to just take a moment to be present in your body, to be aware of what it might be telling you. And if you can, to relax your shoulders, unclench your jaw and do whatever you need to do to be comfortable and share the space with us. So with that, I just wanted to review our accessibility and tech slide. If you're watching live with us, cart captioning is available. So we'll drop the link to that and you can view them in a separate window. They're also available on screen on YouTube if you turn the captions on. And all of these materials will be available on our Padlet, which we'll also share the link to. All of the session recordings are there and they're also available on the BMP YouTube and the BMP Facebook. We are recording this live right now at 5 p.m. Eastern. We have two more sessions. So if you need a time zone converter and a calendar invite to save those dates, you can visit the link on the screen and we'll also drop it into the chat. So moving along, Solidarity Semester is hosted by the Building Movement Project and Solidarity Is. We work to support the capacity of leaders, movements, and the nonprofit sector to engage with and advance social change. We do this through conducting research, generating tools, reports, and materials, and providing trainings and workshops like the Solidarity Semester. I recommend checking out our website, particularly if you're currently working in a nonprofit or other social chain spaces, or if you want to get involved with either of them. Moving on to what you'll gain from the Solidarity Semester, in addition to inspiration and ideas for action and tools, you'll also gain a community. And that's one of the main themes for today's discussion, which, as you'll see on the next slide, is all about how we can act as co-conspirators with Black migrants. So this is our third week. If you missed the past two sessions, you can go back and watch them on our YouTube. And next week we'll be talking about how to center the most impacted by the ongoing climate crises. With that, I went a little fast, so I apologize. And I hope that the captions were able to keep up. But with that, I want to invite and highlight all of our incredible team members who make these sessions possible. So that includes Anna Castro, Shelby House, Deepa Iyer and Kitty Hu. And I'm so grateful to work alongside them and to learn from them. And you're going to hear from all of us today. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kitty, who's going to get us going with our self-care and community care starter. Sweet. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, in vain with what uh, Catherine shared about checking in with our bodies, I want to share this from embodiment practitioner Prentice Hemphill. Reads, uh, boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. Um, and this is something that when I first heard, it completely blew my mind um, because I had grown up thinking that boundaries are something that keep me separate from people. 
Um, but I'm only within the last year really beginning to reframe that and see how boundaries are really a way for me to nourish myself. And as this quote says, to really be able to love upon my community and the people that I care about. So this can look like making sure that after school or after work, you don't check your email anymore or you don't respond to things anymore or ensuring that you set time for yourself on a weekly basis, not just the weekend to check in and to cook yourself a meal that you really like or to go take a walk outside or to pet your dog or cat every hour. Um, it can look different for a lot of different people, but this is our reminder for our self-care and community care starter. And now I'm going to pass it to Anna, who is going to share a little bit more about what we're learning about today. Thank you so much, Kitty. Um, that was a really great grounding. And thank you, Catherine, for that reminder to just be in your body. I find that when a lot of traumatic things are happening, I, you know, there's definitely the tendency to dissociate. Um, and, you know, just being invited to just embrace the emotions that we feel as a response to this moment, knowing that a lot of us are in that same boat. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, and so just going over what we discussed last week, um, we talked about building connections and commonalities, particularly in response um, to the anti-Asian violence that we see popping up everywhere across the country. Um, and one of the things that I think really, you know, resonated for me, and especially in connecting it up to this conversation, um, was the fact that we do have um, in this moment, you know, as the uh, as we saw the news unfold of what happened in Atlanta um, and the targeting of Asian women. Um, we also had the deportation of Vietnamese refugees um, that happened almost like within the same week. Um, and just understanding that when we are building connections and commonalities that we have to understand and we build within our solidarity practice an understanding of the ways in which imperialism, the immigration and criminal legal system, misogyny and class impact Asian, America, Asian migrants and particularly different groups of um, Asian communities in the US. Um, understanding that even the term Asian um, or AAPI is lacking in really like the nuance um, and the complexity of experiences that people have. Um, I also wanna add that when we um, really practice solidarity, we understand that our collective liberation involves points of tension um, and addressing those. You know, in this moment where you had, you know, last week, uh, there was a response by the White House on the uh, on acts of uh, anti-Asian violence. Um, there is no, you know, yet there's no response on the deportation of um, these Vietnamese refugees or no movement in terms of responding to this immediate crisis that families are facing um, when their loved ones are deported. So understanding that at times, you know, there will be points of tension that sometimes involve lawmakers um, responding to some issues and not responding to others. Um, and that really this is a moment that calls to us to really go out and be actively build commonalities. Um, because they are not a given, you know, uh, our experiences with different systems of oppression may lead us to think differently about what strategies um, or what tools are necessary to win in order to protect our communities. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to, to point that out and really, you know, to get us to this place in the conversation where we're going to talk about how we engage in co-conspiratorship uh, with Black migrants. And so with that, I want to just invite us to, um, you know, listen to Udoka Nueke's story. Um, luckily, I have a, a uh, happy um, uh, update on this. But, you know, this is one of those stories that really exemplifies the different ways in which Black migrants are impacted by the immigration system. I am reaching out to share Udoka and Weka's story with you. Udoka is a gay Nigerian man who experienced LGBTQ violence in his home country. As a result, he fled to South America and walked all the way up to the U.S.-Mexico border. When he presented himself at the border and asked for political asylum, he was sent to a detention center for about 20 months. In detention, he was denied medical help and also placed in solitary confinement. Now that Udoka is out, he is undocumented until, he, until his 
asylum hearing. And for the time being, I am asking that you stand in solidarity with Udoka and help me fundraise. Uh, please share this video and donate to the link that is attached to this video. Uh, other ways you can help is by denouncing the incarceration of Black LGBTQ migrants and also showing up for our Central American folk who are presenting themselves at the border right now, many who are queer, many who are Black, and many who are also trans. You know, so just in this video, I want to highlight the fact that, um, you know, the person presenting the video was uh, Alan Belaez Lopez, an Afro-Indigenous poet um, who is from the coastal Zapotec community of Oaxaca, Mexico, um, who is sharing Udoka's story. Um, and I just bring that to even say, like, t at times we literally hear the words act in solidarity, do this. Um, so sometimes our job is half done with knowing how we are going to engage in co-conspiratorship. Co um, but I wanna invite Shelby, you know, to just come in and kind of share some of the usual questions that we get around this topic. Yeah, hi, Anna. Um, thank you so much for this context on like how to be a co-conspirator in this moment. Um, and I think one of the, the main questions it comes to mind is what is a co-conspirator? What is the difference between ally, co-conspirator, and accomplice? Yeah, no, and I think that this uh, question, Shelby, I think goes al along with the fact that a lot of us worry about whether we are a good ally, co-conspirator, um, or accomplice. You know, the, we hear these terms sometimes placed in contrast to each other, um, which makes us, I think for all of us, we're looking to engage in social change to do some good. Um, but there are definitely um, ways in which we see that uh, our efforts may not be aligned with what people are looking for, um, or that we're not wor we're worried that our efforts aren't enough. Um, and you know, going along with that, um, you know, just the the question that I think uh, other people have brought up as well is, what does performative solidarity mean? Um, and Shelby, I don't know uh, if you want to add any context around, like, in your mind, like the performative aspect, how that fits in. I mean, I think in my Kind of journey in this work um as as much as i could not like you know get over my ego and not center myself and when you're centering the needs of people who are affected that's the way to kind of move in this space and performativity um or if you're an ally just to say that you're an ally um and it's more about your your role or your status or getting recognition for your work i think that's a moment to step back and really reflect um, on your priorities and commitments yeah, no, thank you, Shelby. Um, and you know, to that, I, I kind of wanted to just go on the theme of performative to transformative, um, because for, uh, you know, just throwing out there this concept of co-conspiratorship, um, I wanted to just uh, focus on some ways in which co-conspirators engage in transformative practices, um, but also just kind of highlight the fact to your point, Shelby, um, you know, it is, it's not, uh, I think, an uncommon thing to think about what is my role in this moment. Um, and, you know, the idea I think these days that people have about performativity really goes back to social media. Um, the idea that, you know, you are going to post something about your role as an ally um, or going to post your role of something as a co conspirator as a way of, you know, get, uh, raising your clout yeah. um, and or like sharing for the act of sharing. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's like a really, I think it's really uh, telling um, that insecurity that we feel where we both want to be like loudly engaged in this work because we're excited about it because it's aligned with our values. Um, but at the same time, not wanting to center ourselves and our actions in what we're doing. Yeah. And, you know, going back to the presentation, um, you know, pulling up, I think going back on that, you know, so let's talk about feelings for a second. Um, you know, when we're thinking about performative actions, we may be driven by what I like to call outs, like looking from the outside in emotions. Um, so we're driven by shame, guilt, or compassion. Um, compassion being one of the ones that I, I you know, want to explain in the sense that um, compassion at times draws distance. It's like, this is happening over there. Um, 
And then, you know, versus transformative, you know, emotions that are really driven or a drive that comes from the need for co-liberation, um, understanding that you have a stake in the outcome of what is happening. Um, and then I think, you know, to your point, Shelby, too, about like that idea of centering yourself, performative act performative actions or a performative way of engaging in solidarity um, is at times just you're unaware or unwilling to use your privilege or positional power. Um, and in this, you know, in this case, I want to offer then the contrast to transformative, you're ready to listen and be led by directly impacted people. Um, and this is one of those moments where I again raise up the social change ecosystem map as being a really good way of doing that introspective, what am I being motivated by um, in the work that I am engaging in? And also, what is my power in these cases? Sometimes, the, uh, you know, for example, if you're someone that's coming in with amazing um, storytelling background. You know, that is like a power that you can lend um, in the moment. Um, sometimes people, you know, that have really great frontline responder uh, just experience is something that you can lend in that moment. So to be transformative in your acts of solidarity, you're also aware of like, what am I bringing in? Uh, what power am I bringing in that I didn't even think of as an act of power? Um, and then, you know, Shelby, I, you know, the want to just bring it back to, you know, some of, you know, the questions that we had, um, this idea of, um, you know, are you looking to save or fight without building community versus building relationships with directly impacted people outside of a crisis moment, um, being driven by community? Um, in your mind, like when you think about accomplice, ally, co-conspirator, um, what is that initial, what is the initial reaction do you think that a co-conspirator has uh, to a moment of crisis? I mean, as we've talked about a lot, I think centering is paramount. Um, but in terms of parsing all of those terms, ally, co-conspirator, accomplice, um, I remember Bettina Love talking about this, um, and I'll have to find the link. But co-conspirator and accomplice have this kind of implication that it's somehow against like the law or the like order of things. And Bettina Love describes it as like abolition um, has always been something that is, is against these systems that were, it's always been criminalized. Um, and so being a co-conspirator really means taking some sort of risk um, and, and putting yourself in a position to use your privilege um, to serve whoever needs it at the moment. Yeah, no, thank you. And that's, I think, a, a really important part of it too, the act of bringing in the fact that a co-conspirator is looking to build community and take risks with people that they are aligned with. Um, and in order to be able to take risks, you have to build relationships that are consistent. Um, you have to be there um, beyond the crisis. You have to be there before the crisis. Um, and at times your risk may look different or the act of solidarity that you engage with in may look different depending on what positional power you have. Um, and I think this goes to, you know, the understand the self-awareness part of it as well. Um, some of us are co-conspirators, but are also impacted by different systems of oppression. The types of risks that we're going to take have to be aligned with us knowing what are we putting on the line and what is being asked of us in that moment. Um, so thank you, you know, for talking with me about, you know, the performative to transformative aspects of solidarity. I will see you later for more questions and answers. Um, and again, an invitation to people to drop in uh, any questions that you may have in the comments. Um, so I, you know, I want to jump in because we talked about Udoka's story in particular and talking about the fact that, you know, when we think about migration, a lot of the time we tend to focus on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and not a lot of the time we tend to focus on um, Latinx migrants. Um, we tend to focus on, you know, uh, stories that involve uh, dreamers, for example. Uh, and so, you know, looking at this from the perspective of how Black migrants are impacted by the immigration system, we definitely see these same themes that Deepa brought up in the presentation last week. Um, these themes of imperialism, the fact that people do not want to leave home unless they are forced to leave home. 
Um, we look at also, you know, the uh, tack, the ways in which people migrate to the U.S. Um, in Udoka's story, the migration path is thousands of miles long from South America up through Central America into the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and we also, you know, look at the ways in which Black migrants also carry different identities, um, the impact that uh, being a L- Black LGBTQ migrant has in a number of countries in which um, being LGBTQ is criminalized and carries a potential penalty of death. Um, and so I want to move on to this video by Raices um, there, that is narrated by, uh, that is presented by uh, Joyce Louis Jean that really focuses on Black immigrants in the United States. So with the Doka story, we get a kind of holistic perspective of even what it takes to leave home and engage in this many times dangerous journey to the United States. But what happens when a Black immigrant, uh, a Black migrant, is at the border, is in the United States? What are the things that come into play? Um, So this video is going to do a way better job of explaining it than I will. So... Let's watch. Everybody's talking about black people right now. But let me tell you something, baby. Black immigrants are damn near erased from the conversations about immigration in our country. You know all the families that are locked up by ICE that you see on the news? Kept in family detention centers. Almost half of the family locked up right now are Haitian. 44% of the families in immigration detention right now are Haitian. My family's Haitian, ID. And this, this is insane. This is devastating. And here's the real tea. Every shitty thing that happens in the immigration system is even shittier for black immigrants, no matter what country they come from. Black immigrants are nearly three times more likely to be detained and deported on an alleged criminal offense. Yep, which is 7% of the non-citizen population in the US but make up 20% of immigrants fighting deportation. Why? Because black communities are over police and cops transfer immigrants to ICE. And there is no evidence that black immigrants commit more crimes than any other immigrant population. Just so we're clear, no one should ever be locked up in a detention center. But until COVID hit, ICE was busy detaining more people than ever and for longer. And you guessed it, the longest ICE incarcerations on record are all for Black immigrants. It's insane. Like the U.S. automatically assumes that birth certificates and passports from African countries aren't legit. So they launch investigations which keeps Black immigrants in detention for longer. And of course, African and Caribbean immigrants get put in solitary confinement way more than anybody else. Six times more often. And if you're lucky enough to make bail, even our bonds are higher. Bonds paid by Raices for Haitian immigrants were 54% higher than the average bond amount. And when it comes to Black immigrants seeking refuge, yep, Haitians are second on the asylum denials list with an 86% rejection rate. And not so long ago, asylum requests from Jamaicans were the most likely to be rejected. ICE can even make something so horrible, like deportation, even worse for Black immigrants. So let me tell you a story. There was this one flight that was deporting 92 men and women back to Somalia, and the flight usually takes about 17 hours. This one took 40 hours. And that whole time, they were forced to stay seated, chained at their wrists, their ankles, and their waists. And the plane sat on the tarmac for 23 hours. And after all that, the plane went back to Florida and ICE locked those people back up in the detention center. (sighs) From beginning to end, every single aspect in the immigration system is nasty, but it's especially nasty if you're Black. Just like the police is so rooted in systemic racism that it can't be saved, the same goes for ICE. We need a reset button. It's time to abolish ICE and defund the police. Thank you. So, you know, in that video, we had a clear call to action. 
that was based on weaving together the impact of the criminal legal system and the immigration system as experienced by black migrants. Um, and so I first wanna talk about like, again, engaging in co-conspiratorship. To engage in co-conspiratorship, we need to practice active listening. Um, and active listening is listening without the imperative that you're gonna respond to something, um, but with just the purpose of, I need to listen to what is being said to me. And then understanding and accepting the ask that is being made of you. Uh, I believe that a lot of the times when we hear terms like co-conspirator, uh, ally, accomplice, and we think of them in the transformative aspect, um, we do tend to focus on, you know, the idea of I'm going to go out there and, you know, potentially risk arrest. Um, I'm going to go out there and do something that is like very large and public um, to show my co-conspiratorship. But sometimes that is not what is being asked of you. Um, sometimes the asks that are being made are to help elevate and amplify the voices of those that are directly impacted, um, a pass the mic strategy. Um, so a lot, you know, if that is the ask being made, that is what we actually want to listen to as a co-conspirator. Um, I also think that, you know, the other thing that was pointed out, I believe in, in this video really clearly is that, you know, we all may experience systems of oppression but some of us experience multiple systems of oppression. Um, and some of us are the designated targets of those systems of oppression. Um, they were designed particularly um, with certain communities in mind. Um, and when we think about the history of the immigration system um, and the history of the criminal legal system, it's impossible um, to disentangle it from one, you know, the act of um, treating black folks as less than human um, through enslavement. Um, it's impossible to um, really divorce the concept of borders without thinking of the land that was stolen from indigenous people. Um, and so these systems have at their very core, these uh, uh, spirits, um, these ways in which they may have transformed, these, these systems of oppression may have transformed in their architecture, what they look like today. Um, and so, you know, the fact that we may experience this, you know, coming into the context of there are many different immigrant communities, um, but immigrant communities experience the immigration system in the immigration, immigration legal system in different ways. Um, and understanding that this is not a challenge to the identity or experiences that you may hold of that system, um, but rather an opportunity to sharpen your political analysis, to open your um, understanding to the idea that there may be a different solution, one that you may not have considered before because you didn't see it before. Um, and then lastly, you know, really thinking about co-conspiratorship as um, kind of the, the mirror um, to creating their systems of oppression and their systems of liberation. Um, and really engaging in co-conspiratorship moves us away from being reactionary to acts of violence, um, to these systems of oppression, to actively building networks in which we free each other, in which we are liberated. Even as we're living under this, this oppressive system, we experience mutual liberation in each other's company. Um, what this looks like with really thinking about um, anti-Black racism is shifting from you know, your responsibility being fighting anti-Black racism to really uh, actively embracing, uplifting, and creating space for Black leadership, experience, and demands. Um, and, you know, in co-conspiratorship, having a stake in the outcomes is a part of it. And what if the outcomes are that we see a transformed world by giving those that are closest um, in their understanding of a system of oppression the access and tools um, to be able to implement, you know, our networks of liberation? Um, and I wanted to highlight in this, you know, the fact that we want to, in co-conspiratorship, focus on our actions. Um, we want to go beyond the binary of feeling like I need to be a good ally or good co-conspirator. Um, I'm afraid of being called a bad co-conspirator, um, but really understanding it in terms of a growth mindset. Um, you are going to have opportunities to engage in co-conspiratorship your entire life.
Um, which means that, you know, there are times where you're going to tag in, times where you tag out based on your capacity. Um, as, you know, Catherine brought up earlier, you know, there are moments where we are going to feel overwhelmed. Um, and in those moments, we need to care for ourselves um, and restore ourselves so that we are able to share uh, our light, our power, our privilege um, with, you know, in service of the cause. Um, and also, you know, the uh, again, this idea of, you know, if we are in co-conspiratorship with communities that we may not have direct contact with at any given time. Um, you know, this is just a call to really switch up our consumption of media, of culture and of spaces. Um, when we see that the spaces that we're in are not diverse, we have to think about how do I actively create the possibility that someone would be welcome in this space? Um, and you do that through really, again, practicing some active listening in the different uh, forms of media that you consume. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I feel like to me, co-conspiratorship really involves community being the goal always building relationships that are meaningful, regardless of whether you're engaging in work together. Um, regardless of whether you are currently strategizing on an organizing campaign, um, you know that you have someone that you can count on that is going to Venmo you money for lunch when you've been off handling, you know, uh, taking care of things. Uh, you have someone that is going to just check in on you um, during difficult moments. That caregiver role, I think, is a really important aspect of cultivating your co-conspirator practice. Um, there is no FOMO, in my opinion, there's no fear of missing out, a fear of not being present in the moment of crisis when you know that your goal is to be there consistently in community and that sometimes your acts of co-conspiratorship are going to be care, are going to be nurturing, are going to be, um, you know, healing, are going to be engaging in weaving, guiding, um, you know, however that looks, um, how, whatever role you feel most comfortable stepping into. Um, and I want to add in, you know, the just bringing in this graphic from uh, Black LGBTQI Migrant Project um, and the quote, you know, summarized is, you know, after the election, a lot of people and, you know, in under this new presidential administration, some people may have gotten the perception that things may overnight just be better, um, that we don't have to have the same sense of urgency. Um, but really, you know, what Eniola says is normal was never good enough for black communities. Normal looks like police still acting, um, still carrying out state sanctioned violence. It still looks like people being deported. Um, and so we need to strive as co-conspirators to understanding that we wanna create the world that we wanna live in. Um, and if we, you know, feel like we are comfortable. Um, we have to really interrogate, you know, just looking around and seeing like, this doesn't feel comfortable to other people. Um, what does that mean for how I can engage in my co-conspirator practice? And, you know, um, I just wanna also say, you know, solidarity as a concept is indebted so much to the practice of black communities um, in the United States and around the world. Um, you know, looking at the ways in which, again, in the Black community, there's a variety of nuance and experiences. Um, and looking at how pr uh, practicing solidarity involves putting those that are experiencing multiple systems of oppression at the center when we think about responding to crises. Um, so another example um, comes from Black LGBTQI Migrant Project, um, in which they um, have as a demand under this new presidential administration, um, wanting to decriminalize sex work and drug offenses, which lead to the to um, the uh, jail to de uh, deportation pipeline, um, particularly for black queer migrants. Um, understanding that the criminal legal system is designed to be a dragnet for black community members. And that if you are a migrant, um, that this has potentially like very dangerous consequences where you may get sent to a country where your identity puts you at immediate risk of death. Um, looking at the ways in which, you know, mutual aid as a concept, this example by Baji in which, you know, folks are pledging their stimulus checks 
um, to a mutual uh, relief fund for undocumented black migrants. Um, you know, again, the concept of mutual aid um, is really owed to the black trans community um, that had developed networks of survival um, because they were left out of movements um, for social change. Um, and lastly, you know, the act of solidarity being an, a global uh, a global call to action. Um, just wanting to highlight this campaign that is currently happening in which um, black migrant organization, black migrant led organizations in the United States right now are working with advocates in um, Kenya and really focusing on uh, bringing attention to what is happening in the Kakuma camp. Um, in which uh, this is an internally displaced persons camp. Um, and folks in this camp, LGBTQ folks in this camp have been repeatedly attacked. Um, you know, and in this latest moment and uh, earlier in 2021, um, these horrific acts of violence have necessitated a call for immediate uh, relief and immediate movement um, from the folks that have been impacted outside of this camp, taking them somewhere where they will be safe and able to recover. Um, so, you know, again, this diasporic uh, element to how we practice our solidarity work, again, we, we uh, are indebted so much to how Black organizers have shaped how we engage with the world. Um, and so, you know, wanting to just focus again on the fact that co-conspiratorship um, can be uncomfortable. Um, co-conspiratorship can, you know, lead us into understanding that there are conflicts even within social change movements. Um, you know, in terms of understanding the architecture of oppression, um, really thinking through both the physical buildings, the jails, prisons, and detention centers um, that are meant to uh, hold humans, um, laws and policies that disproportionately impact Black people. Um, you know, these, these types of um, systems, there are moments in which we really, uh, in our pursuit of wanting to change a system, we don't interrogate the actual architecture of it. We perhaps just shift the target of who is going to get caught up in it. Um, and so pointing to right now, there's um, this thread um, and this statement by uh, Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Baji, um, that really calls attention to the fact that a proposed piece of legislation, the Dream and Promise Act, um, has in it what are called criminal bars. Um, criminal bars mean that folks with criminal convictions of a certain kind are not eligible for relief. Um, and this has been a consistent struggle in the immigrant rights movement. Um, you may have perhaps already heard uh, the uh, good immigrant versus bad immigrant critique. Um, you may have already heard the idea of like, um, we are all immigrants or a nation founded by immigrants um, as being critiqued as well. You know, language that is used by the immigrants rights movement to point out how immigrants are foundational to the United States is harmful in its framing um, and ahistoricalness of the founding of the United States. Um, and so I point these thing, point these two statements out to show that there can be disagreement within affected communities. Um, and, you know, that disagreement at times, as I said before, to be a co-conspirator, you want to really interrogate uh, this through your political lens, um, knowing that it doesn't discredit whatever experiences you may have, but is actually a call uh, to do and uh, to do and create something better. Um, and so Baji right now, you know, again, calls attention to the fact that these criminal bars within this immigration um, proposal leave out a group of people, leave out black migrants. Um, and that also, you know, the immigration movement as a whole has some work to do on really interrogating what is the basis, what is the goal um, of what we are trying to do with enacting uh, legislative relief. Um, are we privileging citizenship and leaving out huge swaths of people? Um, understanding that Black folks born in the United States also don't even reap the benefits of being citizens of the United States. Their rights are routinely violated or not acknowledged. Um, so where is it? What is this actual victory that we are trying to win? Um, and as I said, it's very difficult to have these conversations because re uh, real people's lives are at stake. Um, and there are no easy answers, but there is uh, generative 
conflict and principled uh, and transformative relationships. Um, and so with that, you know, I want to, you know, move into our uh, Q&A section um, and see if there are any questions that we would like to cover. I have some questions. Um, so first, I loved your point about the growth mindset, because I think it can be so overwhelming, particularly in this moment, to even just start. Um, and it can be scary because that people's lives are on the line and you don't want to hurt communities, especially if you aren't sure where to start or what to do. Um, and you're just scared of messing up. Um, so the first question I want to ask is like, what do you do when you screw up? Um, if you got called in for uh, being, you know, not being the co-conspirator that you needed to be, what do you do? Oh, you're muted, Deepa. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. I can try to start um, answering that question. Um, so I think the first thing to kind of keep in mind is that, you know, every single one of us makes missteps um, and that we're all on a learning journey and there's no moment where you just kind of get it right and you're done. So I think it's important to have that mindset, as you said, Shelby, you know, just if you're going to engage in ally work, if you're going to engage in co-conspirator work, um, go in with that sort of stance and that orientation. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge that it's really hard not to get defensive. Um, it's really hard not to get upset, to feel guilt or shame or embarrassment if you are subjected to critique, especially if you really came in with a very open heart and good faith. Um, so all of that is natural and it happens in movement spaces. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes we think that when we're doing this work that there's no conflict, that there should be no conflict because it's about relationships, like we keep saying, and it's about social change. So um, any whiff of conflict um, might seem like, oh my gosh, I've done something horribly wrong and I can never show up in this organizational space again. I should just leave and never return, right? And so I think we have to, you know, kind of develop this sense of, um, yes, there will be conflict. And it's about building our capacity to engage in it in a way that, you know, feels um, as much as possible, as healthy as can be. So if so, keeping all of that in mind, um, some steps that, you know, folks could think about taking and all of this comes from my own many, many missteps over my own life, um, trying to be an ally in certain spaces. Um, so I think one, one thing to do could be to take a pause and to recognize and validate what it is that's coming up for you. A second is to actually check in with others in your ecosystem um, who are going to be honest with you and who are going to be, you know, gentle but honest with you um, and ask you some questions to do your own reflection. Um, and that reflection could really help to um, line up with some of what Anna talked about earlier, right? So as a co-conspirator, did I ask for permission? Did I build relationships first? Um, did I acknowledge my privilege? Did I acknowledge what my own stake is in collaboration? So the questions could really help us reflect on how we acted. Um, and then a third step is if you feel comfortable to ask for a direct conversation with those who did critique, that's very difficult and not everyone can do that. But if you're capable of doing that, again, from a learning space, to do that, and if so, and if needed, um, bring in someone who can perhaps mediate that conversation through the through a transformative justice lens, which often means that I, I'm learning um, first an acknowledgement of harm, um, a question about how that harm can be repaired, and um, activities or intentions to restore, um, and so that. You know that's got the acknowledgement of harm, the accountability, and 
uh, readiness to repair. Um, and on the other hand, the other side, the person who criticized that they too are interested in that process because it can't be a one-way street, that they also want to um, understand how the call out may have hurt you and that they too want to transform themselves perhaps, right? Um, so those, those are four steps, the pause, you know, check in with feeling about your own feelings, check in with others in your ecosystem, ask how you acted as a co-conspirator, and then request a direct conversation and um, try to follow a restorative justice approach. So those are some um, steps that folks can take, um, but call outs and call ins are quite common in our spaces and we should expect them and not avoid them. Yeah, Deepa, I, I agree with all the, everything that you outlined. And I will say that one of the things that I believe like all of us have been reckoning with potentially lately is, you know, as we start hearing more conversa conversations on abolition um, and, you know, this critique of understanding that punitive measures of, um, punitive measures of dealing with like what may be the worst day of someone's life um, are not actually the way that we continue to like hold people in community. Um, and so I know that for me in thinking about call outs and call ins, I really started to try to like in my own spaces, think about, you know, am I acting out of, um, revenge or am I acting out of liberation? Am I acting out of um, what intention am I really setting with my call out? And also what is my investment in this being a transformative process as you named by both people? Um, just as like a way of just considering both, you know, both positions that people may find themselves in in this situation. Yeah, when you're on the other side of that critiquing, what are you think is the difference between a call in and a call out? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that a call in is often done when you have um, an intent to actually build and keep and restore relationships. I think sometimes there's this sense that, um, you know, call outs oftentimes are happening not necessarily in spaces where people know each other or have to build together. They oftentimes happen on social media or they happen when people don't know each other. Um, or there's a perception that someone who's an influencer is saying something or doing something and well, I can't reach that person to have a direct conversation with them. So I'm just gonna call them out, right? Um, and there are times and moments when that's necessary, right? Um, especially if that uh, influencer or whoever it is actually is doing consistent harm or if there is no way to reach them even through intermediaries. Um, I think Anna is so right when, you know, by saying that it's important to examine intentions. So if the call out is actually um, happening from a place of, as Anna said, revenge or a place of anger and frustration and, um, uh, you know, a personal beef that someone has, right, with someone else, um, that's different than a principled call out, which is actually um, about the issue or a stance on an issue, right? And so, um, so I think that's one distinction to make, right? So if you are actually calling out um, at, versus calling in, then you may not be interested in building a relationship. Um, calling in is a, a way of, again, understanding that we are like in, a, in an ecosystem together, that we're all gonna wind up in spaces together, that it's um, better to actually uh, talk to each other, then make assumptions. You know, a lot of this is just how we build relationships in real life. Like, how are we with friends? How are we with, you know, significant people in our lives? How are we with family, right? And so I think like the muscle that we are all building about, you know, when we get hurt, how do we respond? Like we're on a process of learning and unlearning that. And I think it shows up sometimes in movement spaces too, where we're, you know, um, hurting each other when we might not need to exercise that muscle. Um, so call-ins, build relationships and have an intentionality to do so. Call-outs 
are oftentimes not necessarily along those veins. And then the last thing I'll quickly say is that, um, you know, there are there are issues between people, and then there are issues about issues. Like like Anna said earlier, there can be principled struggle about two different policy stances, right? So I think it's also important to think about and um, identify like what is it that we're calling in and calling out a relationship, a person, issues. That too is important to figure out. One final thing I wanted to pose to you both is no community is a monolith. Like not everyone is going to think the same thing about a given issue or policy. Um, so what do you do and where do you start when there are like multiple conflicting positions? Do you, do you want to start Anna or do you want me to start? Um, sure, I can start. Um, I will say first, like I said, it is difficult um, because, you know, the considerations that I think all of us at the end of the day have is that we want people to be safe. Um, we want people to survive. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is only so much shuffling of a, of a argument, you know, a, a part of oppression that is continuously embedded in our society that we can do before we realize like this whole thing is just not going to work. Um, I think the, you know, the defunding the police uh, aspect that was brought up in the Raices video and that was consistently also brought up with other um, black led organizations is a good example of that. You know, for many years, we've said reform, um, criminal justice reform. Uh, and, you know, finally, there reaches a point where we recognize like this cannot be this cannot function the way that it is now. Um, I think that also lies at the core of abolish ICE. Um, this entity as it exists now does not work. Um, and so I think that when you, for me, at working in this space, I've absolutely, one of the first things that I thought was, I am a US citizen working in immigrants' rights spaces. I do not um, suffer the impact of these spaces in the same way that other people do. So I need to listen to people that are actually like they are, their lives are on the line um, and take my cues from them. Um, but then I also just began to say like, well, who's, I'm listening, but I, like I said, different communities are not a monolith. So I'm like, I'm going to continue doing my research, continue doing my research, um, talking to more people, building more relationships. Um, and I think to me, it comes down to at the end of the day, like holding the principle of like, is this a, um, is this reform or is it liberation? Can it be one of those in the long term and one of these in the short term? Um, and I think, again, the two positions that I came down to are like, um, is this anti-Black? Um, is this something that reifies a system of oppression? Um, and making a decision based on that. I would just add that um, oftentimes if you're not you know, within the directly impacted group um, and you notice these multiple conflicting viewpoints, not entirely sure that it's necessarily in your place to, um, you know, decide what the best course, <laughs> course of action is or even suggest it. Um, I think that, you know, and I think it's also important to recognize that it is absolutely okay for communities and campaigns and organizations to have different points of view. That's actually not a sign of weakness. And I had to learn that. Um, myself the hard way, you know, I used to think that. I used to say, why can't everyone just be on the same page and have one unifying message so we don't have all these conflicting messages? But what I have learned is that um, that is actually a, the process of, um, of, of understanding something more clearly, right? When we actually disagree, when we um, have generative conflict intention, it pushes us to be sharper, it pushes us to be better and clearer. And so it's actually a really important process to, um, to, to, to have these different viewpoints and to think about what makes sense in one context might not make sense in another context. So I think this, uh, so I think also just being okay with um, those sorts of, of um, conflicts or folks not being on the same page, building the muscle to be okay with that is another way of being a really strong co-conspirator. Well, thank you both. Um, up next, I wanted to 
to share, a, we've talked a lot about how you can be a co-conspirator and we wanna give you all some action steps for um, steps you can take to be a co-conspirator with black migrants today. Um, so in the United States, there are hundreds of thousands of people who hold what is called temporary protected status. So due to conflict or national natural disasters have um, been displaced from their home countries. And Haitian TPS holders, um, I think El Salvador and one other country I'm forgetting make up the bulk of TPS holders, um, but they are also at risk of deportation. And in the past few weeks under the Biden administration, there have been more deportations of Haitians than in the entire 2020 fiscal year under the Trump administration. So UndocuBlack, um, Haitian Bridge, National Network for Arab Communities, African Communities Together and Adhikar have put together um, this petition that you can sign to tell Congress uh, to pass the SECURE Act to ensure permanent protections for TPS holders. Um, and if you go to the bit.ly link, you'll also find phone banking instructions. So you can call your representative or senator and let them know. Um, and then our next resource drop, which Anna touched on earlier in the presentation, um, is about this camp, Free Block 13. Um, in Kenya and upcoming this next week, there's gonna be a week of action. Um, in this week's newsletter, you can you can find all the tools and all the steps that you can take. Um, and you can get involved in a bunch of different ways. So you can donate, you can sign the petitions, you can get the word out in different ways, um, but we hope that you'll, you'll keep an eye out for the newsletter um, and get involved. And I'm gonna pass it on to Catherine to let y'all know what's coming up next in the Solidarity Semester. Thank you so much, Shelby, for sharing all these great resources. And thank you, Anna and Deepa, for leading us through that Q&A session. Um, I'm excited to learn more about Free Block 13 Week of Action, which is starting today. And just to recap everything we covered today, and we covered a lot, um, Kitty shared a self-care and community care starter and reminded us to practice setting boundaries. So boundaries are healthy and necessary, and they not only help ourselves, but they help others. Anna walked us through another principle for transformative solidarity practice, co-conspiratorship. We also recapped last week's principles and identified how connections and commonalities when pointed inward give way, to, give way towards our own growth as co-conspirators. We discussed how our solidarity practices lead us to an understanding of how imperialism, the immigration and criminal legal system, misogyny and class impact Asian and indeed all migrants. We also shared Udoka Nueke's story and ways to support him and act in solidarity. We covered some common questions like what's the difference between being an ally and accomplice and a, and a co-conspirator. And we unpacked what it means to move from performative to transformative co-conspiratorship with an emphasis on actions, learning and building community. We also discussed ways to practice co-conspiratorship, particularly with black migrants, such as engaging in active listening, and embracing, uplifting, and creating space for Black leadership, experiences, and demands. We talked about solidarity in action and how we recognize architectures of oppression. We identified that physical buildings, policies, and laws that disproportionately impact Black people have created a practice of co-conspiratorship and collaboration to which we owe many of our current activist practices. We also talked about conflicts and movements and how as co-conspirators, our actions are what guide us. We imagined how to move from systems of oppression to systems of liberation by cultivating a growth mindset and the practice of co-conspiratorship. Finally, we held a brief Q&A session where we addressed the differences between calling out and calling in, how to accept criticism, and how to handle conflict. Deepa offered action steps and reflection questions for how to embody transformative justice values, specifically how to take pause, acknowledge harm, take accountability, and demonstrate a readiness to repair that harm. Finally, we ended with the resource drop that Shelby just shared. Next week, we'll be talking about how we can center the most impacted by climate crises. And similar to how this week's discussion focused on the impact of the US immigration and legal systems on people both inside and outside of the US, um, next week we'll be taking that same kind of global lens and touching on how climate disasters disproportionately impact the global South. So please register to receive our updates and materials. And so you can join us next week. Um, we'll pull up the link and we'll also drop it into the chat. And finally, we also want to invite you to group chats, which will take place tomorrow, Thursday from 8 p.m. Eastern to 
and 5 p.m. Pacific. These informal and casual spaces are meant for you. They're to dive deeper into the week's materials, bring any questions or comments you may have, and you can connect with others who are here for the same reason that you are. We'll be there along with a few Solidarity Semester alumni from last year, and we'll drop the link to join in the chat, and it should also be on screen. So thank you to Anna, who keeps our team on track, who presents all this information in a way that's really clear and actionable. Thank you to Deepa, who brings us all together and for creating and sharing such helpful materials and for always answering all our questions. Thank you, Kitty, for the self-care starter and for being our StreamYard director today. Thanks to Shelby for pulling together all of our links and resources and for sharing the research. Out. Thanks to everyone who joined live or who's watching later on. We hope you'll join us tomorrow for group chats and next week for session four. Bye.